Okay, so here we go. Um, welcome everybody. My name is Lisa Musgrove and I'm a librarian here with the Sonoma County Library. And the library system is pleased to partner with the Sonoma Department of Emergency Management for this third and final presentation of our series of emergency preparedness. And this one is about being informed and staying connected and just a personal note, I live in the Sonoma Valley and in 2017, that was the big challenge, was knowing what was going on, uh, knowing where the fire was um, and knowing what we were supposed to do. And after the fact, when information did start coming out, we realized we were half a mile from the fire and we didn't know. And I think that was, I think 2017 threw everyone for a loop and I'm just thrilled to be not only hosting this program, to, but to be able to watch it too, because that's, I found the most important thing sometimes is knowing what is going on and how to stay connected. So I'm looking forward to this just personally. Um, so a few reminders for today's event, please keep yourself muted and pardon me for a moment. I'm gonna admit some folks here and I can't click and talk at the same time. There we go. Okay. Um, a few reminders for folks, please keep yourself muted during the program. We will have time for questions and answers at the end. And if you do have a question, you can use the chat function and we'll do our best to answer it. Uh, and as mentioned earlier, this is both in English and Spanish and the recordings will be on the library's YouTube page and will also be on the partner's YouTube pages as well. So if you like what you see, tell your friends and neighbors to watch it. Um, and lastly, this, is, this program is part of the uh, library summer reading program that goes through August 14th. So go to the library's website at sonomalibrary.org, sign up, track your reading and earn prizes, books and raffles to local businesses. So um, just a little library plug there. And I think that's all um, from my end, Nancy Brown. She is the community preparedness program manager um, for the county and the Department of Emergency Management. Very busy department these days, no doubt. And so we're thrilled to have her for her third performance here in our program. And, <laughs> and uh, I guess take it away, Nancy, and please let me know if there's anything you need from me during the program. Awesome, thank you so much and welcome everybody. Um, it always makes me feel so happy when we um, provide an event to help people understand how to get more prepared and people show up. So that's super great. Um, this is an important thing in Sonoma County. I'm sure if you've been here for more than a minute, you recognize that um, this is not an if something will happen type of community. It's a when something will happen, will you be ready? And um, our goal at the Department of Emergency Management Community Preparedness Program is to provide all the information that you need so that you can limit the amount of disruption anything has in your life and that you can enjoy living in this beautiful community and feel confident that you can stay safe and keep your family members safe as well. So today we have a um, action-packed agenda for you. We're going to have Sam uh, Wallace from the Department of Emergency Management, our alert and warning manager, um, talk to you about different types of alerts that the county is using. And then we have a great segment on neighborhood groups and community groups. So this is really the sweet spot. Um, if you can't get in touch with um, the county for some reason, if you can't use other types of communications methods, your neighbors are there to support you and you're there to support your neighbors and really keep each other safe and keep each other aware. So there's a lot of assets in your neighborhood and you're one of them. And so finding different ways to organize within your neighborhood and meet your neighborhood goals is super important. And we have Roberta McIntyre, we have Priscilla Abercrombie, Skip Gerald, Daryl Paul and Alma Bowen all here to talk about different organizations that they're involved with. So lots of different ways that you can get organized in your community. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Sam Wallace, who will be talking to you about alert and warning. Take it away, Sam. Well, thank you, Nancy, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me today and taking the time to be a little more prepared for uh, our next upcoming disaster. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now. Yeah, so I've got a little, uh, little bit of a slideshow so that uh, hopefully I can explain uh, what we're doing. And again, my name is Sam Wallace. I'm the uh, Sonoma County uh, Department of Emergency Management uh, Community Alert and Warning Manager. And yes, that uh, does all fit on a single business card. Uh, and my primary role is uh, to wake everybody up 
and get them informed as early as possible during a disaster. Let's see if I can make this work. Uh, I thought I'd start out by talking about uh, the various types of alert and warning systems we have. Uh, we actually have many. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with at least one or two of these, uh, but I thought I'd uh, talk about the various ones we use and uh, then we'll go into a little bit of uh, how they're going to work and uh, some difficulties we have with them and some uh, benefits to them. So the one we uh, talk about a lot is SoCo Alert. And I should make it clear that SoCo Alert is a, is a system we use that works off of a, of a large database. If your house is in that database, we will use telephone, we will use text, we'll use email. Uh, we will communicate with you through all of those uh, but it does require that you be on that database. And that's one of the reasons we encourage people uh, to uh, sign up for SoCo Alert. Uh, but uh, just because you're not signed up doesn't mean you're not on it. Uh, we actually use a variety of uh, databases to build it, including the uh, PG&E customer database. Uh, we purchase uh, phone numbers from AT&T and Comcast. So we have a very robust system, but uh, about one to two percent of the people are still not on it. We're still working on uh, filling that. Uh, this is one you may have heard about is in the news a lot, uh, the Wireless Emergency Alert System or WIA. Uh, this is different than SoCo Alert. You don't need to sign up for it. You can't sign up for it. Uh, it's just a system where we can send a text that is accompanied by a very annoying uh, uh, alarm, and it will send a very simple text message to you. Uh, now, of course, it uses the cell system, and so, of course, the challenges that we have with that is during a major disaster, uh, that cell uh, system may, in fact, be inoperative uh, in your area. Uh, but still, this is uh, one of the first, uh, use, uh, first systems that we use to attempt to communicate with you. There's also the, alert, the emergency alert system, which you're probably all familiar with. That's when the radio or the television is... Uh, uh, occasionally gives off a loud tone and said this is a test of the emergency alert system. Uh, we do use this system uh, to get information out to you, but of course one of the challenges of it and what we mo are most concerned with is we really can't wake you up with this system. And that's why the SoCo alert and the wireless emergency alert systems are always going to come before this, uh, but we do use this to at least get your attention and get basic information. And I should say that shortly after this, we're going to be uh, communicating with all of the major networks uh, and radio stations in the area and feed them more detailed information. There's limits to what we can put out in these uh, alerting systems. Uh, most of it is just making you aware that something is happening, uh, giving a general idea of what the danger is and what you need to protect yourself. But the more detailed information is going to have to come uh, through radio, television, or the internet. You're all probably familiar with Nixel, and there's a lot of confusion sometimes between Nixel and SoCo Alert and the Wireless Emergency Alert system. Uh, Nixel is operated by many different jurisdictions within Sonoma County, but we don't actually operate it uh, from the Department of Emergency Management. Uh, the sheriff uh, operates the only one that is countywide, and although they do put information out, uh, they they don't know that Nixel won't wake you up. It's a very passive text system. So it's a good way of us getting information out once you're alerted, uh, but it isn't a good system to rely on for being uh, uh, notified initially. Uh, a lot of, I hear a lot of complaints you now saying, well, Nixel, I'm not getting Nixels whenever there's a fire near me. Uh, the sheriff has had to reduce uh, significantly the amount of Nixels they put out. Uh, they now do it only when there is a significant danger to the local population. Uh, so you're probably, if you signed up for Nixle, you're probably still signed up for it. Uh, we're just putting uh, less of them out. One of the new systems that we're using, because if we look at all those systems that we looked at before, those uh, four, the SoCo Alert through Nixle, uh, all of them kind of rely on existing telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, the cell phones, the uh, landlines, uh, the televisions, and the radios. And the problem with all of those is they're reliant on power. And of course, if the power goes out, uh, a lot of those systems can quickly become inoperative. So we've been trying to come up with another system uh, that, uh, that gets around that. And uh, one of the ones we have is the NOAA weather radio. It's a small unit you can purchase. It costs about $30 uh, on Amazon. And when you're 
uh, or whatever your preferred uh, purchasing area is. And once it's set up uh, and you have it on in your home, it will remain silent until the National Weather Service activates it. And once it activates, it uh, sounds a really loud alarm and then a robot voice will be sending you a very basic message of what we have. And we, we do really encourage that you have this as kind of a, a backup alerting system when uh, all these other systems may become inoperative. Uh, the one that we uh, have been handing out with the county and the city of Santa Rosa has both a, uh, a battery backup as well as a plug-in, uh, meaning that even in a power outage, it's still able to function. Uh, the next system we use is the high-low sirens. Uh, pretty much every police department and the sheriff uh, now uh, has these installed. Uh, and uh, all it is is a, a different uh, sounding siren than you're normally used to. Uh, it sounds like one of those European uh, sirens you sometimes see on TV uh, with the beep, boo, beep, boop. Uh, and uh, in, in a situation where we're evacuating an area, uh, these vehicles will drive through your neighborhood and will sound them off. But I will tell you, don't rely on hearing them. Uh, we uh, do periodic tests, and even though they're very loud, uh, your soundproofing on your house is very good. Uh, so very often, we, when we do this test, a substantial number of people will tell us afterwards they did not hear the high-low siren. Uh, however, we still use it. Uh, we still do door-to-door -door, uh, checks on people if we're evacuating, depending on the availability of the law enforcement uh, agents. But that said, I will tell you what the most important uh, system that we have out there, and that is neighbor to neighbor. And I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, all the systems I've talked about, there's going to be something that's going to keep it from working. Uh, you know, for cell phones, for instance, you may not answer the phone because you don't recognize the phone number that's calling you, uh, or the cell phone tower might be out, or there might be bad reception that day. Uh, sunspots, uh, any number of things. So one of the things I absolutely encourage is get to know your neighbor ahead of time and uh, agree that if you do get an alert, if one of you gets an alert, inform the other one. Check on your neighbor just to make sure that they got the message and they are, uh, they're moving at the same time. This is certainly going to help us. And, and who knows, maybe you'll make a new friend if you haven't already made one. Uh, lastly, I, I did want to talk about if you do want to sign up for SoCo Alerts or Nixol uh, or get more information on all of these systems, I really recommend that uh, you go to socoemergency.org and then you can click uh, on Get Ready and sign up for alerts. Uh, we have a lot of uh, videos in there also that show both in English and Spanish uh, some of the uh, systems that we have and uh, giving some background on them. Um, I'm not really going to go, I am going to tell you that uh, just a quick visual on SoCo Alert, uh, the way it works for us, it's a very targeted uh, system. Uh, if we do fire off a SoCo Alert, uh, you'll see the uh, map to the right, the shaded area. We can make it that exacting so that only people in that area are going to get the SoCo Alert. Uh, so that is one of the benefits of that system is we're able to target it. But uh, I'm just going to zip through this because of time. But I will tell you that by comparison with the wireless emergency alert, uh, we don't have that kind of control on it. And this is a complaint that I have uh, after some alerts, like yeah, I got the alert, but I wasn't in the area. Well, unfortunately, the wireless emergency alert is very much a broadcast system. And so while I might target something like this, uh, this area might be affected which means that some of the areas that I wasn't intending on alerting get alerted, and some of the areas that I did intend to don't get alerted. Uh, and we're, uh, we're learning more and more about how that system works. Uh, we wor we're working very closely with the FCC and the FEMA to make it more effective, uh, but it is uh, one of those things that is a challenge as we go through this. Uh, I also wanted to show you, and this is all on the internet, uh, and you can get it through the SoCo Emergency uh, website, uh, the NOAA weather radio is a, a great system that we have, but if you actually look at where it uh, is able to communicate with, it has its limitations. Uh, it's uh, just a single radio transmitter, uh, and so there are portions of the county uh, that won't get it. Uh, but we are actually working on a program uh, to extend that range and to get into the more 
uh, isolated areas of the county uh, so that uh, we can expand that. So that's, a, that's gonna be an ongoing project for many years. Uh, a lot of people sometimes come up to me after a disaster and say, why didn't I get the message? And the number one reason that people don't get the message is that they're not in the alerted area, uh, which is a good thing. You shouldn't be getting alerted if you're not in danger. Uh, but another one is, is the cell system didn't get it to you. Uh, and there can be a variety of reasons for that. Uh, the, the, the tower might have been down. During the Nuns Tubbs fire, as an example, uh, we lost uh, 72 cell phone towers that were knocked out of operations. But another one is you simply didn't answer the phone. And there could be a variety of reasons of that. Like I said, you don't recognize the number. And, and just so you know, this is the telephone number that's going to call you. And we have this on our website, but if you want to write this down and program it into your cell phone, if you have this in there, then you will be able to say, oh, wow, I'm getting a SoCo alert. Uh, and uh, it's not somebody who's trying to sell you something that you don't want. Another bad one we have is that your battery was dead. Uh, this is especially a problem once the power goes out. If we have one of the Pacific Gas and Electric's uh, famous power shutoffs, uh, very quickly, your power can be, uh, or your battery can go dead because you might be uh, trying to obsessively get information. Uh, and uh, of course, you want information. Uh, but of course, when we finally get to the point where we have to alert you, you just might not have enough power in your battery to get it. And this is also another very common one. Uh, if you turn your phone to vibrate or put it in the airplane mode or do not disturb, uh, I can't get a hold of you. Uh, I have no power to, uh, uh, to override whatever do you do to your phone. Uh, so this is a significant thing that you need to keep in mind if we're in one of those red flag warnings is make sure that your phone is going to wake you up. And of course, one of them is just the power is out. Uh, if you've got a handset that is um, a, a wireless handset, uh, even if the, uh, we're still able to get a hold of you normally, your handset just might not work because it doesn't have any electricity. And then lastly, yes, we do occasionally make mistakes. Uh, we have uh, a really good track record over the last uh, two or three years of getting alert and warnings, but uh, I am very uh, uh, transparent about the fact that sometimes we make a technical error. We made one during the glass fire, which we did not realize, but we do learn from our mistakes as well. Uh, we looked into what we did. Uh, we came up with a procedure to prevent it uh, uh, ever again, uh, but we do our very best to get a hold of you. Uh, but yes, we do occasionally make the mistake. All right, so when the time comes, what we're gonna tell you, we're gonna ID ourselves. Perhaps it's the Sonoma County Sheriff or the fire department. We're gonna try and tell you what the threat is. Uh, we're gonna try and tell you where the location of that threat is, but that can be difficult for us. During the Nuns Tubbs fire, we did not have a clear idea of where that threat was, so we couldn't transmit that information. To you. Uh, that's one of the reasons we've gone with the evacuation zones. If uh, you don't know what your evacuation zone is, I strongly suggest that you uh, uh, find out, uh, because this is one of the ways we're going to tell you is, we're not going to say, you know, this neighborhood, but we are, but, uh, but we're gonna say zone 3C3, for instance, so that you know that you're generally in the area of, what's, of, of the threat. We're also gonna recommend an action, and that's usually going to be to evacuate, to shelter in place, or get ready to evacuate. But the thing is, is we may not be able to tell you the exact location of the threat, we may not be able to tell you initially what the safe and unsafe routes are. We won't do that until we are absolutely certain. And we may not be able to tell you immediately where the evacuation centers are. It's gonna take us time to activate those uh, assets and get them to where they need to go. And I do urge you that once you've got the initial alert, get onto radio, TV, or social media, including socoemergency.org, and we will, uh, we will get information out there as soon as we can. So I'm gonna kind of uh, go through this very quickly and just say that on uh, Tuesday on the July 20th, uh, around noon to 1 p.m., we are going to be doing a, a large scale alert and warning test for the county. 
It'll be in East Santa Rosa for SoCo Alert. And if you have a NOAA weather radio, uh, we'll be doing that. Uh, that concludes my little briefing. Uh, I will stick around at the end of it for answering any questions. And Nancy, uh, I guess back to you. Thank you so much, Sam. And if I could get you to stop sharing. All the things we say now that we never said before. Who would ever ask someone to stop sharing? But now we do that. Stop sharing. <laughs> anyway, and um, of course, my personal favorite is you're on mute. But luckily, I'm not right now. So next um, up, and thank you so much, Sam. That was super awesome. We are going to hold questions for the end. Um, I have put uh, some supplementary information on Sam's talk in the chat. So there's a link there to SoCo Emergency Sign Up. There's a link there uh, to the Santa Rosa um, NOAA Weather um, Radio Program. And there's also a link there to the Know Your Zone page. So you can look up your evacuation zone. So next I'm going to go to Roberta McIntyre, who is going to talk about the um, neighborhood program that she's involved in. Take it away, Roberta. All right, thank you, Dr. Brown and Sam and all of you for all your hard work in this space. Um, I am the president of Fire Safe Sonoma. We're a private nonprofit public benefit company that a corporation, I guess you'd call us technically. We've been working in the space for well over 20 years now. So we were doing this while then fire safety stuff before it was even popular. Um, and just to be clear with Fire Safe Sonoma, I want to remind folks that we're a proactive entity, we're not a reactive entity. So, you know, we do a lot of work on the front end, helping people get prepared for a wild vampire. But during the fire, we don't do a lot, oftentimes because many of our staff and board members are busy doing other things. And also just, you know, we are a nonprofit. So I'm working full time right now for free um trying to get stuff done and we're seeking funding so feel free to donate if you'd like to um and so um and after i talk i'll drop some stuff in the in the chat that i'll speak about here so our fundamental preparedness um program if you will is called ready set go if you visit our website you can get a copy of our ready set go booklet it's very good at um, showing you how to be prepared and the, basically the fundamental things we ask people to do to be prepared is number one for me is, is be, have everything ready to leave your home and evacuate. And Sam Walls, he, he was really good about talking about all the alerts. And what we tell people, our audience, is that don't count on any one of those. All of them have benefits and weaknesses. And there's no one that works well. Where I live, um, it's kind of sporadic. So sometimes some things will work really well, sometimes other things won't. So just use all those tools you have available. The other thing we like to tell people, remind people, is don't just have one evacuation route in mind. So, you know, we all drive our usual paths as humans, we're very um, habit oriented creatures. So, when we drive to work, we drive that same way all the time. And oftentimes if there's a traffic collision or construction and we have to reroute, we're like, oh my gosh, how do I do this? I don't know any other way. So ahead of any kind of evacuation, try different routes. I mean, if you're living up in Camp Meeker, oh my gosh, that place is like, wow. You know, try different ways of, of moving around your community. So not if, but when you're asked to evacuate and you realize that your usual route isn't available, you will be familiar with a secondary route or a third route. So play with those, know those in advance. And then with regard to your building, making your building safe, the, the cheapest, easiest thing you could do is your defensible space. Make sure that you have, you know, hazardous vegetation cleared, you know, trimmed, cleared, managed around your structure. We're working right now with funding, thank you from Sonoma County PG&E um, Settlement Funds. We're working with a coalition of folks on resilient landscaping, education, and outreach. So you'll be seeing that come out probably in a few months. You're going to see us offer education on how to do some um, healthy fire um, resistant landscaping without having to make a moonscape around your house. 
which is very important. The second thing you can do to prepare your home is, is do as much as you can to make it um, structurally resistant from you know, fire. So the number one priority for the Bay Area, based on recent studies from recent fires we've had, the number one most important priority is your attic vents. You know, if you do nothing else to your building, you know, do at least something with your attic and soffit vents because embers can travel way far away from the main body of a fire and the wind can push those little embers right into your attic spaces and get your your insulation going. If you have storage in there, it can ignite it. If you have open wood up in there, which many people do because insulation is pulled back or you don't have insulation, you get embers landing on the combustible wood. And then, you know, once that thing gets in there, there's nothing the fire department can do. And then the third thing is, is have your go bag, which really to me is most important, which goes with the alerts. Have your go bag ready to go. And there's all kinds all kinds of lists of things to put in your go bag. Look at them, play with them. But I think the go bag is a very personalized thing. There's no one list that works for everybody. It's kind of like packing your bag to go on a trip. There's things I take that other people don't take, you know, and there's things that I don't take that other people take. So it's very personal. But the main thing is to make sure you have enough things in your go bag to be pretty much self-sufficient for a couple of weeks. I think about it as, you know, I'm traveling on a two week vacation. What am I going to take? You're going to take your meds. You're going to have your glasses. You're going to have those things. And if you don't have duplicates of those to preload in your go bag, at least have a list. You should have a list anyway. Make your list customized for you. So those are the things that we all recommend. I'm trying to keep this short because I know we're limited on time. I did the math. I've got about five minutes. I can talk for a very long time. So um, for more information, visit our website. I'll put that in the chat here in a moment. Um, you can get resources from our website. I'll also in the chat put a couple links to our uh, monthly meetings. We have monthly meetings. The public is invited. And a few months ago, we started a monthly meeting called the Fire Alliance group or Fire Alliance meeting, where we get together with all of the stakeholders and shareholders in the community, COPE groups, Priscilla routinely attends these meetings. Um, I think um, um, some of you have attended these meetings. Alma's attended our last meeting, I think. And so if you attend those meetings, it is another good way to stay informed in terms of what's going on out there, what grants are getting funded, what are people doing in the various communities. We've got fire safe, local fire safe councils in there. We've got Firewise communities in there. We've got CERT folks in there, COPE folks, you know, anybody that has any interest in this space uh, are welcome to attend those meetings. So. I'm not sure how I am on time, but Nancy, I'm guessing I'm approaching my five minute time. So I'll keep it there. And I would be more than happy to answer any questions when we get to the Q&A. And if I do have extra time, I yield my time. Thank you so much, Roberta. Really appreciate it. And you were right on time. Great job. So um, next I'm going to introduce Priscilla Abercrombie, who is with um, COPE, Northern Sonoma County. And COPE stands for Citizens Organized to Prepare for Emergency. And so take it away, Priscilla. Ooh, you're quick on the draw with that. Nice. <laughs> if you're speaking, I can't hear you, Priscilla. going to get you unmuted here. Well, what there do we you go. know? Gosh, Perfect. Thanks. All right. Can you see my screen or no? Yes, absolutely. Okay, cool. Um, so I am Priscilla Abercrombie. I am the uh, leader for the Fitch Mountain Coke Group and also the board chair for an umbrella organization that is a nonprofit and fire safe council called uh, Coke Northern Sonoma County. So we're, we represent the fourth district. Um, 
I wanted to, so I'm going to share with you some information about what COPE is all about, just really briefly, the steps that you, um, that you do in order to get a program going, um, and contact information. I'm not going to, to get into too many details. Um, I really want to say before I get started that you know, it's it's people like Roberta McIntyre and Fire Safe Sonoma and Nancy Brown and Sam Wallace and and all of these other folks that you're going to hear from today that keep me informed and educated and and learning from their wisdom over many years of doing this work. Um, so I consider myself a newbie to all of this and and really my focus really is on helping neighbors connect. Um, so uh, let me share with you uh, what that's all about. So um, the mission of COPE is, is really to help residents, families, and, and neighborhoods um, become better connected and able to respond and recover from emergencies that happen. This program that we have is adopted from the Oakmont program that was started by um, the Homeowners Association in Oakmont with Santa Rosa Fire Department and the American Red Cross a number of years ago. So there are seven steps. Um, the main, the first step that you might want to think about is where would your Cope community be? What would that represent? So for an example, Fitch Mountain is our Cope community. Um, it actually encompasses both unincorporated and the city of Healdsburg, for instance. So just define what your area would be. That would be the first step in, in getting a program together. Second would be who can do this with you? You're interested in, in connecting with your neighbors and being better prepared as a community. Who else can help you make this happen? Really strongly recommend that you find someone to co-lead with. And then the next step is to start building a community. So with that map that you have, break it down into smaller parts. Where can you start with neighborhoods in that community? And where can you find people to be the leaders for those neighborhoods within that community? So I have a neighborhood on North Fitch Mountain Road. I'm responsible for about 10 homes in this area. That's what we're asking people to do is really just in your area, the people that you meet at the mailbox, the people that you drive by and talk to um, that are really near you, those, those could be your neighborhood, all right? And then is to gather information from that neighborhood, getting to know your neighbors, what's the best way to contact you? Um, where's your water shut up and your gas shut off? Um, do you have anybody in the home who's disabled or might need extra help if there's an emergency that happens? Or is that person a medical provider or have somebody in the household who knows how to run a chainsaw? A, 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 you know, a major tree comes down and blocks the road. Who are the people in your neighborhood that you can go to that have resources and can help you? And who are your neighbors that you need to help? So that's, that's the survey part. And then it's really having ongoing meetings. Um, as a community, I would suggest meeting at least once a year. Sometimes people meet twice a year. Um, but meeting as leaders of the various um, neighborhoods within the community, that can be done more frequently to check in with each other, work on communication plans. And the next piece is assessment. What is it about where you live that puts you at risk for an emergency? Is that you only have one road in and one road out? Is it lots of fuels and bad vegetation management in your area and you need to work on that with your neighbors or the um, county officials or local city officials? What is it that your, puts your neighborhood at risk? What are the kinds of projects that you would want to work on? And a lot of that work can be um, funneled into something that we call FireWise, which is a um, a type of community-based preparedness program. I won't get into that right now. And then the next piece is really, what are the educational needs in your neighborhood? Is it alerts? Do you need Sam Wallace to come and talk to your area or someone from the Department of Emergency Services 
is it the fire department that you need to have come out and talk about fuels and how to how to do defensible space? Um, maybe somebody from Fire Safe Sonoma can talk to you about assessing um, in your area some of the risks. And then finally, you know, it's really about maintaining those plans, maintaining your leadership, maintaining your education in your area and your and your communication amongst each other. So that's just kind of a brief um, introduction to what what um, what you can do with a co-program in your area. And then next, I really want to just give you some information about how to get a hold of us. Our website has a ton of information on it about how to start co-programs. Um, we have we hold an office hours once a month at 3.30 on Tuesday, the third Tuesday of the month, and you register in advance, and we're happy to sit down and talk with you about getting a code program started. So that's all that I have right now. I'll put a lot of this information, contact information in the chat so that you have access to it. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Priscilla. And um, if you have not had an opportunity to um, interact with the Cope Group in Northern Sonoma County. It's a super active group. They have a lot of great leadership and they're a real inspiration for a lot of areas in the county to um, really grow something special. And I know that um, in the last fire season, a number of those Cope members up there discussed um, at group meetings how instrumental their safety was um, supported by their Cope interactions um, in the Glass Fire and in the Wallbridge Fire. Um, because they were in, in a COPE group, they really felt like they um, were able to keep themselves and their family safe. So next, let's go to Skip, who is on, with the Sebastopol Map Your Neighborhood effort, which is another really up and coming, growing effort in the county to um, get neighbors together. Ready, Skip? All right, All right. thanks, Nancy. Thank Hi, everybody. Um, Skip Geralds, I'm the Public Safety Outreach Coordinator um, with the City of Sebastopol, working uh, primarily with the Fire Department. We do have a Map Your Neighborhood program, and I think it's very, very similar to what Priscilla just described. Um, that's, we don't have to really devise anything new. This is sort of standardized. Neighbors need to get together. There's some basic steps. Um, we happen to have nine steps that we talk about in the Map Your Neighborhood program. COPE has the seven steps, but primarily they're the same steps. So the thing that, that I wanted to talk to you about is what, what we're primarily trying to get our neighbors and neighborhoods to do is to just simply be willing to take responsibility. That's something that we need to do for ourselves and understand much like I think what Sam was describing, even at that level, at the county level, it takes them time to understand what's going on and to get into action about what's going on. But primarily they can do those things because they've thought of a lot of these things ahead of time. So while they're dealing with these chaotic moments or hours for them in the beginning, they have a basis under which they're already operating waiting to find out what's going on and then knowing what to do. And that's really what COPE or Map Your Neighborhood or any kind of neighborhood program is about, is for neighbors to have a basic understanding of some key things that you would do immediately following a disaster. And in order to be able to do that, you need to think about those things ahead of time. So being willing to take responsibility for yourself and then being willing to reach out into your neighborhood and start to work together with the people in your neighborhood. So to support that idea, I'd like to be able to tell you about something that happened in our area. I'm in the West County, obviously. There was recently a residential fire on Vine Hill Road where the property was pretty much um, it was uninhabitable after the fire, but it was a map your neighborhood neighborhood and they had just met a couple of days prior to this particular fire and so they knew all of the contact information for the owner of the home they knew to they knew how to be able to contact their other neighbors to be able to support what was going on there was a tenant that had been in the home and was burned out of the home obviously and so before the night was done they had come together with clothes 
uh, food. They had some, uh, evidently some uh, uh, gift certificates that people went and got for this person. Red Cross came in, but the neighborhood essentially came together to support this person. And the owner of the property, I think who was out of town, support the owner because they understood each other and they understood what skills and what resources that they had as individuals and collectively as the neighborhood. And they came together very, very quickly to be able to assist this person. Ultimately, that's what I think the neighborhood programs are about, is allowing ourselves to get to that stage where if something were to happen, and nobody wants it to, but if something were to happen, we would be able to, at least in those first little, those first few minutes or that first little while, we would know some very basic things to be able to do. And if nothing else, it's to connect with each other, to try to find out, do you know this? Do you know that? Have we found out about this? So we know enough about each other to be able to come together. And I think that's really, really important. And, and this group felt great about the fact that they had come together. And one of the small pieces that was put out that I thought was really interesting is the tenant that was there had not attended any of their meetings, their Map Your Neighborhood meetings, but they came together simply because it was the right thing to do for the person that was in the home at the time. And, it's, and they felt great about that effort afterwards. So that's sort of a side benefit to be able to work working within your within your neighborhood, so um, uh, the Sebastopol Map Your Neighborhood program has just started a um, new website, and it is um, SebastopolReady.org, and there's a lot of information about the Map Your Neighborhood program. There's a lot of information just about getting together in your neighborhoods. Um, it does. Is, it is quite specifically about items in Sebastopol and West County, but nonetheless, really good um, information. And that's something that I would really hope that you would be able to check in on. The other thing that I want to mention is, is that I think much like um, uh, Priscilla's, much like the Cope Group, where they have their get to, their sort of like office hours, we have something called a leader council, and we also meet once a month. And essentially, that is very active leaders coming together and being willing to share their time with new leaders that haven't yet had the opportunity to implement the program. Maybe they have some curiosity about what it takes to implement the program. So once you take the basic class for Map Your Neighborhood, then you have the opportunity to con conceivably anyway, speak with some experts that have gone through either rural because you're rural or in town because you're in town or maybe a multifamily and we have people in all of those categories that are prepared to spend their time to talk with you about what they've learned and maybe to, to also learn things from you. So that basic idea is a really solid idea to be able to come together. And please go to sebastopolready.org. You can find out information and I will put my information in the chat also. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Skip. Really appreciate that. And Map Your Neighborhood is growing in Sonoma County. I know that there's a big effort afoot in Sonoma Valley. Um, so there's a, a big group starting down there as well. So um, lots of great things happening in the county. Next up, a little bit different twist on neighbors helping each other. Um, a little more technical, but super fun and interesting. I have Alma Bowen, who wears many hats in the county, but is also an active CERT member. It's your turn, Alma. Thank you, Nancy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here representing CERT today. Um, I do wear multiple hats and this is probably one of my favorite ones. Um, I became a CERT participant, um, went through the class and in late 2020, I took the uh, CERT instructors course. So I'm now a CERT instructor under uh, Jeff Peters who is the program manager of CERT Northern uh, Sonoma County. So CERT is a little bit different, Nancy. It is um, rather than on the preparedness side, as we've heard uh, with the other neighborhood organizing programs, um, the CERT uh, Community Emergency Response Team, um, it helps the community, it educates uh, volunteers about disaster preparedness 
um, and the hazards that may impact the area. But what it also does is that it trains them in basic disaster response skills, such as fire safety, light search and rescue, team organization, and disaster uh, medical operations, uh, mostly triaging patients. Um, if there's a mass casualty incident or an incident, a disaster where we have many um, community members that have been affected, uh, the CERT team could come in and help um, go through the areas and triage and even uh, help rescue. Again, it's light rescue. It's all um, skills that any lay person that's interested can learn. Um, so the CERT teams, um, the CERT volunteers are designed to help uh, emergencies before professionals arrive. Um, so one of the things that we've learned through the fires and uh, during the Thames fire in 2017, I was a 911 services dispatcher here in Sonoma County and I worked that night. And what we learned is during those critical first 72 hours of the disaster, oftentimes our professionals, our rescuers, the fire department, ambulances, uh, police departments are busy dealing with the disaster. So we may need to have our neighbors be the people that help us. So neighborhood organizing is essential and these CERT teams can be critical. So CERT, um, CERT offers consistent nationwide approach to volunteer and training. There are ongoing trainings, uh, uh, different uh, volunteer opportunities. During COVID, the CERT team has helped in different ways uh, during COVID uh, vaccine and testing. Um, during evacuations, we helped uh, doing uh, helping with the evacuation routes. Um, so certs get implemented, cert volunteers are used in many different ways once they've gone through the course. Um, you can volunteer at the EOC checking people in and out. Uh, we did that uh, during the fires. We were uh, at the EOC at the um, emergency operations center, we took shifts and we were checking people for COVID protocols, their temperature, asking the questions. And so again, CERT volunteers become essential uh, to our infrastructure here in Sonoma County. Um, so right now you can join CERT or uh, join a CERT training through um, through the end of July, so through July 31st, we're offering hybrid programs or hybrid trainings only, where most of the training is online, and there then there is a one day in person for the hands on training part of it. Um, after July 31st, we plan to do both hybrid and in person cert training. So. Um, the information will be available. I will give information in the chat at the end as to how you can get a hold of um, Jeff Peters if you're interested. Um, what's really uh, exciting right now is that as a CERT instructor, I help Jeff with all his classes, uh, but now we're also building a curriculum. Um, well, we're using the CERT curriculum, but we are actually gonna start offering classes, CERT classes in Spanish as well. So that is an exciting development. Um, that we're so excited to onboard. Uh, it does take a little bit of work to get it all um, dialed in, but we're looking forward to doing that. So if you are interested, again, I'll give you an email address. We do have a, a CERT website that's currently under construction where we're gonna start listing trainings as they become available and scheduled. And, um, and then it'll be a way for community members to participate and get that training. Um, as a CERT uh, involved instructor and also being part of CERT, we'd love to invite everybody. Uh, on August 7th, we are going to be at the Northern Sonoma County Fire and Earthquake Safety Expo at the Citrus Fairgrounds in Cloverdale. Again, it's Saturday, August 7th from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. CERT will be there doing all kinds of cool stuff um, that, that the uh, community can um, participate in and watch as well. Um, and there's gonna be a ton of activities. It's gonna be a kind of passport system where as you go through and visit different displays, um, different uh, safety information and, um, and exhibitions, you'll get marked off on your passport and then at the end, we have a certain amount of go bags that we're gonna be able to give to community members that have gone through and, and observed and done some of the activities. Um, I will be there as a CERT member and uh, I wear two hats. Uh, my other hat is I am the, the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called NC or Nuestra Comunidad. And I will be doing both English and Spanish um, LISTOS trainings and providing LISTOS disaster guides uh, to, to anybody that attends those. So lots of really cool um, 
things that you can see. And the most cool opportunity, we are still needing 15 volunteers for a disaster simulation that our CERT team needs to do that day. So um, we're gonna have a moulage uh, artists there that's that are that will take all our volunteers and give them wounds and different things and then as a cert team we're going to go through a disaster simulation that day so if you're interested in volunteer again we still need 15 um, to play the victim of a big disaster um, it'll be a lot of fun it's a great way to participate maybe get your hands wet in the cert program and really understand a little bit more what we learn and um, what what we would be doing during disaster times in community um, so again uh, jeff peters is the program manager um, i will share his email we have a facebook page he is in the Bahamas right now, so that's why I'm here talking to you about CERT. Um, but we're excited to um, to let the community know a little bit more about this program. And hopefully, as we get our more trainings up and available in both Spanish and English, uh, anybody that is interested in going through the training and becoming a CERT volunteer uh, for uh, the Northern Sonoma County CERT will have an opportunity to participate. One of the things I love about the CERT program is that when you participate as you when you come in don't let it be a little bit daunting if you think like i can't do that i can't do uh, <coughs> okay and okay rescue. okay okay skip you're not muted um so uh you have the uh, you know the opportunity to learn these skills and we are able to tailor it um for in anybody's specific needs uh, and there's a lot of roles so you don't have to do the search and rescue you can help in other ways so uh, again i'll put it in um in the chat and i will leave it there uh thank you for your time and uh, it's really great to see people wanting to get involved uh, in different ways thank you so much alma i'm really looking forward to that event it looks like it's going to be a county-wide event and there's going to be a lot of people from all over the county so wherever you live head on up to Cloverdale on August 7th. So now we have Daryl who is going to talk to us about um, ACS and I'll let you say what that means Daryl. Okay thank you Nancy. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Daryl Paul, uh, amateur radio call sign KI6MSD and I wear many hats in amateur radio. I wear a couple of different hats in ACS, the Auxiliary Communication Service, which, as I said uh, earlier in the introductions, is part of the Department of Emergency Management. We are the uh, amateur radio component of um, the Department of Emergency Management. So, uh, and at the end there, I will, uh, in the chat there, I'll put my uh, email address if there's uh, questions. So uh, we have about 125 current uh, members in ACS throughout the county. Uh, we are all registered disaster service workers. So uh, we have you know, experience and training in uh, doing emergency communications. Uh, I was directly involved in the uh, power shutoffs we had a couple, three times uh, recently, as well as the uh, fires. So what we do in uh, ACS, for example, with the uh, power shutoffs, uh, firehouses have the emergency call boxes. Well, if the power is out, uh, I put together a team of amateur radio operators to station to be stationed at the uh, firehouse. So if someone had an emergency, they would contact the uh, amateur radio operator who would then in turn would contact the net control, which was at the Office of Emergency Services. Uh, net control is uh, kind of like the dispatch, if you will, like for your other emergency services. I was the person that uh, was you know, in charge of the radio communications for that. Uh, if you feel like you want, and I have very limited time here, uh, if you are feel like you might be interested in learning more about ACS or becoming an amateur radio operator, uh, and I'll put my email address in the chat here. It's uh, ki6msp at gmail.com. Also recently, uh, last month of June, uh, I put together an interoperable uh, exercise drill 
with GMRS, General Mobile Radio Service, which is being used uh, quite a bit in uh, West County right now because we have a lot of locations, uh, Occidental, Casadero, Greenwood Park, those areas do not have cell service or reliable uh, communications in the event of a disaster. So again, using the neighborhood groups in those areas, uh, people are getting trained in using uh, GMRS radios, which is different licensing than uh, amateur radio. And the way that that worked is we had uh, amateur radio operators at the different uh, firehouses uh, in uh, the Russian River area, where I'm the unit leader for the Russian River area for ACS. And uh, so we had, you know, Sebastopol was a uh, shelter. We had Grayton Fires a shelter. And uh, it was a really good uh, exercise to see how we can enter interoperable with GMRS and with amateur radio. Uh, to get communications out. Uh, myself uh, and ACS will be at the uh, August 7th event uh, in Cloverdale. And uh, if you have further uh, questions or information, um, you can see me or the other ACS volunteers. Uh, I think I'm running close out of time, Nancy. Is that about right? Yep. Thank you so much, Daryl. And we are close to um, time, but I did have a couple of questions that um, we weren't able to actually answer within the chat that I did want to um, elevate. So first of all, for Sam, um, Dusty wanted to know, do they have to sign up for those alerts every year or does that carry around from year to year for them? Uh, great question. Uh, no, for SoCo Alert, uh, once you're signed up, you should be good. But if you do move, you're going to have to go back into the system and uh, change your address. Otherwise, we'll, uh, you might get a phone call for a house that you lived in five years ago. Thank you so much. And um, Roberta, there was a question um, in the chat about the size of um, screen you need to protect your vent from ember, embers. So do you know right off the top of your head what that is? Yeah, the, the size now, the maximum size you should have on your vent is one eighth inch. It used to be quarter inch with the older codes, but, and that's technically a requirement for any new construction if you live in a, in a wild and urban interface area, designated area. But I would recommend you go to one eighth inch regardless. Perfect, thank you so much. And um, I think those were the two questions we were unable to get answered in the chat. I really appreciate all of the presenters today who took a look at the chat and answered questions as we went along, that was super awesome. And um, I, again, just wanna thank everybody for coming today and for taking this time. I hope you learned something today. I hope you will um, continue to learn more about emergency preparedness. If you missed the first session and the second session, they have been recorded and you can go to socoemergency.org to our video page and you can see those there as well as at the library's page. And this also will be recorded as well and put up there. So if you learned something and you feel like you have some friends and neighbors who need to learn the same thing, go ahead and give them that link and they can capture that information for themselves. Um, and of course, don't forget to go to that August 7th event because we're going to just keep on learning. So I will um, close it there and give it back to the library to close out our session. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you, Nancy. So I just want to thank everybody again. It was really informative. I took a lot of notes. And um, it's just a kind of a good feeling that we can, even during this time of you know, COVID, we can still come together as neighbors far and wide, virtual and, and real, and help take care of each other. And it just gives me a good feeling. So thanks for coming, everybody, and be safe.